again, I'm going to start with the last comment you made, July 2021. We heard earlier that it might be a dress rehearsal for what's coming. You live here, you're on the ground, you're seeing what's happening, you communicate in, uh, in Zulu with Zulu speakers. Would you agree with that gloomy assessment? I don't think it's a gloomy assessment. I think it's an accurate assessment. I think if we continue to think that we can live separate but equal, or we think that we live separate but equal lives, then we are not addressing the realities of the majority of South Africans, which is people going to bed hungry, people living with no hope of a better future. Uh, and there's only so long that people can live in that state of being or mind before something gives. So I think it's an accurate assessment, and if we don't resolve those as a country, um, then it's only a matter of time before what we saw in KZN and parts of Gauteng becomes a reality everywhere. So how? How does one resolve that? Everyone occupies a, a space in society, whether you're a business person, a politician, a teacher, whatever you are. And in the spaces that we occupy, we each have power to affect some sort of, of change, positive change. Whether it was teaching children or being a better politician or treating your employees better, whatever it might be. And I think that we collectively need to see nation building as not something that is external or separate from us, but something that we have to internalize and each take active steps towards uh, you know, fixing. Unemployment, poverty, corruption, um, all the things that we know are, are wrong and that we hear every single day. We need to actively take steps towards resolving some of those things and holding people accountable, specifically those who have the power to affect change, accountable. Are you, are you really the exception that people are seeing you as? Uh, we heard earlier from Ethel, uh, where he was describing the young people of today, who are not interested, they don't want to take responsibility, they want instant gratification. And I said, well, maybe Chris Pappas will disagree with that, because I guess you would call yourself young, still. How, how would you answer that question or that issue? I think the two are not linked. Um, I think that yes, young people do want self-gratification and you know, like previous generations wanted you know, upward mobility. Um, so th there's diff genera different generations have different things that they expect and different characteristics, but I don't think that means that young people are dismissive of the problems that we face and the desire to solve them. I just think that the political system and the social system that we exist in um, does not cater for the type of involvement that young people want to be involved in, uh, or the activities that they want to get involved in. Um, I, I don't think I'm an exception so far as being passionate about wanting to see a change. I think there's many, many people. I mean, people wouldn't come out to, to cathedral, um, to, I mean, to the mountains, to champagne sports, if they weren't passionate about change. Um, but I do think that the rigidity of, of the mechanisms for creating change do discourage young people from participating. So how does that get changed? I think we need to create more, more spaces for young leaders um, to, to be heard, to experiment, to uh, put their ideas on the table. Um, we need to understand that you know, many of the, the laws, the policies, the plans that we have for this country were drawn up you know, 30 years ago and are based on things that happened 30 years ago and that society has moved forward and that we need to understand that and the best way to understand that is through the eyes of the people who are closest to that experience, that is young people. Um, I also think that you know, politicians also, pol not just politicians, civil society in general, leaders need to give space to young people to express themselves, lead, um, and in many places you don't see that, it's just lip service. You went to Hilton College. How many of your class still live in South Africa? Ma many of them have moved. Um, I wouldn't know exactly, but I, I mean, you chat with the guys, and it's many people in, in the UK, especially Australia, um, and, it's, and it's sad. Many people have started small businesses that could be here. Uh, many people who tried to get employment or tried to get access and couldn't because of something as arbitrary as skin color. So, yeah, many of them have moved, but 
equally many of them are dedicated South Africans who are, you know, I met a, I met a mate the other day who is the most unlikely person to become a teacher, but now he's a teacher. Um, so, yeah, there many of them are here. Because a, a leader is a peddler in hope. Now, you peddled quite well today. Relative I didn't get an applause at the end. <laughs> you got an applause, applause at the before. end as well. But how do you go along to the class of Michael House, the matric class this year, and maybe <coughs> initiate or be the catalyst for a different reality for them 10 years hence. In other words, not half of their class will be overseas, and not just my class, obviously Hilton too. I, it's an interesting question, because I actually did address um, boys from my class, college, and uh, Marisburg College, and Hilton, uh, in a very unique program where they take um, children out of impoverished or poor families that would never have the opportunity to go to these schools. And many of the questions they asked revolved around that, to say, we see all this bad news, uh, we see all this despair, but, you know, and we see all of, you know, even their teachers are telling them, you know, when, when you've graduated, go overseas and get opportunities there, get experience, go there. And the exact same question came up. And it's difficult to answer when there is this constant state of despair. But what I said to them was that each one of you needs to decide uh, what your role is and, and how connected you are to your past and future where, you know, you currently exist. Many of you come from a space uh, where access to opportunities like this are few and far between. Do you want to perpetuate that or do you want to play an active role in trying to change that? And it's not going to change overnight, but if we lose more capable people, if we lose more passionate people, then it's going to be further away and harder to achieve. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a hard question to answer, but to stay hopeful. Um, to, to look past the rhetoric, to look past the, the abuse and the twisting of information for, you know, gain of power, um, and rather focus on those things that are beautiful and good, um, and put effort into making those things work. We, we heard Kim van Ketz last night use a lovely phrase that I told her I would steal, pathologically passionate about this country. You clearly are too. You hear, you have the world... Uh, as your oyster, you're well qualified, you smart, we can see that, you're presentable. Why are you doing what you're doing rather than some of those classmates who aren't? Also a difficult question because I could, could be paid a lot more in the private sector. Um, I was fortunate to grow up with no struggle or challenge. Um, my parents were well off through, as I said, through hard work and unequal access to opportunities as many white people were during, during apartheid days. Um, I went to a good school. I've never been hungry. But I've also been exposed to situations, people, uh, circumstances where the harsh reality of not having access to opportunities um, sort of hits you in the face. From, I mean, a simple example is the people who I grew up with, my friends and my family on the farm, are nowhere near and will never be where I am today. Um, just I'm talking in terms of level of access. And that's through no fault of their own. Uh, the same as the, you know, the, the informal settlements that I used to walk through in Mlazi or wherever it might have been, is I want to use my privilege to create something different, something better for the people around me. We'll, we'll start taking questions now, so if you can put your hand up, I, right, uh, and the microphones will get there. Tell us about that TLB. Why were you so excited about the, TL, the picture, the famous picture? It, I, I've never... <laughs> When I drive along the N3 past all the, all the roadworks, um, I never thought I'd get excited about seeing yellow plant equipment. But now I, you, know, you kind of look and you say, I need one of those, and that would be great, <laughs> and that could work there. Um, you can do so much with something as little as a TLB in a municipality. Um, and I'm not talking, I mean, we're not a metro. We not, not have you know, hundreds of thousands of people in big cities. But a TLB allows you to fix the landfill site, to clear dump sites, to dig graves for poor people. 
Um, it, it just opens up so many opportunities. So something as simple as that, to take you know, 1.6 million rand away from something that, you know, that was not useful, um, or stopping a contract that is clearly overpriced and reprioritizing that to something as simple as a TLB made me so excited. Uh, staff actually made fun of me because wh while it was waiting for its, li its license, it was sitting outside my, my office window. And they said, ah, oh, Mayor, you're just putting that thing there because you want to look at it, look at it. Um, which, w which was sort of true, but it was waiting for its license. But yeah, um, wait till I get my refuse compactors, then you'll see some lacquer pictures. <laughs> Anyone but Graham? Yeah, Gra I'm Graham's not allowed to. Yeah, can Rory. Chris, first of all, thank you and congratulations for all that, that you're doing there. Um, my question kind of relates to something that Athel said, and it, it revolves around, do you have in the Umgeni municipality a youth um, development, a youth leadership development program? Because we all know that youth unemployment is through the roof. And if not, what are you doing to give those, the young people, hope? Because they, I find, the more you talk to the youth, the more uh, depressing negativity you find. And I think that your problem is, I mean, that video is... <coughs> Thanks, a great question. Hold Thank on, you very Eric, much. I just need <laughs> to say that the problem with Chris's municipality is that it's in the Midlands, but it's in the KZN Midlands. And I think I speak for everybody in this room. Nobody here is investing in KZN today. And I'd just like your comment on that. Good, Thank you. Good point. Double question. Thank you, uh, Rory. I, I would disagree with you. There's four billion rands worth of investment in Hilton at the moment. So there are some people investing in, in KZN. Um, but thank you for the question. Um, so yes, we do have a youth department. Uh, when we got into government, the budget was one million rand for, for various development programs. And we've increased that to one and a half million rand. So we've we trying to, to put resources towards that. What we also found is that this is generally an office that, it's, that is abused for, for shows, events, um, for some sort of show, political showpiece. Usually the money is spent before some sort of a rally or uh, you know, elections, which we're investigating at the moment. But there was no meaningful contribution to improving young people's lives. So, and I say this because as, as a municipality, we're also an employer. It's hard to employ young people. It's hard to employ young people because, you know, whether it's a level of education, experience, lack of preparedness for the workplace. So we're redirecting that budget to, to make more meaningful interventions. We're partnering with a number of, of social partners where we look at the skills need of the local economy and rather train young people in the skills deficit. Even if it's a barista or, uh, you know, someone, how, how to fold a bed in a hotel skills where they'll actually be absorbed into our local economy. So we, we're doing that. We're also trying to make young people more employable. So we have a work readiness program that starts to be rolled out tomorrow. When's the first? Yeah, tomorrow. Um, so a number of programs shifting away from big stadium type events um, where you put up a stage and you pay the, you know, the local guy 15,000 Rand to be an MC knowing that he'll write nice things about you on Facebook during election times. So to make more meaningful interventions there. The next step in that is to, to see how we can better partner with the private sector. So to, to, to go to a big employer and say, can we fund um, or partly fund the salary of a young person for a year who can then get some sort of experience, can ben then benefit from that? And we're in discussions with a number of the bigger companies in the area um, about things like that. So just making more meaningful interventions into to youth development. Um, my question is very quick and simple. And I don't know how many people here... Microphone closer, please, Mick. I don't know how many people here witnessed your extraordinary campaign, which led to your being made mayor of Umgeni. And I'm, it's, it's a pity we couldn't have put it up here. But I wanted to ask you simply this. How much did your fluency in Zulu impact the outcome of that election, not only for you, but for your party? And your, your ability to, to relate to the people of the district. And just for our investor here, 
there is a shortage of farms in Natal at the moment. There are too many buyers. Thank you. You're going to regret that statement about investment <laughs> into KZN. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're in the wrong place to make those kind of statements, Rory. Do it in <laughs> Joburg, no problem. Yeah. A disclaimer, Mick, Mick was my, my neighbor growing up. Still drive past his old farm when we go, go home. Um, I, th I think it did have an impact. Um, how much, I'm not sure. But I think it's more the ability to connect with people in a way that you know, they understand, and that is language. It's a powerful tool, something that we, we take for, for granted in, I think, politics in general, um, but just in discourse. Everything is you know, usually just English. That's the, that's the go-to. Um, your campaigns, your TV ads, your whatever it might be is usually English. That's the go-to political medium. Uh, Athel will know this from, from, from being on the ground. If you can speak to, to someone in a way that they understand, um, using their language, you can convey much more meaning and authenticity in what you say. But I think more than that is going to where people are. Um, we, we went to people's homes. We, we went to places where we weren't expected to go. Um, and we we're doing that and our opponents weren't. We made sure that it was a local government election. We took away the, the noise and the, the, the rhetoric that's out there at a national level that has nothing to do with your bread and butter issues of local government, your street light, your potholes, your unemployment, and we spoke to people about those particular things. Um, it did make a big difference. I, I think the campaign as a whole, and I had a brilliant campaign team, made a difference as a whole. Um, in terms of our political party, um, we have the highest black support in the province. Uh, whereas the DA gets around 3% of black support in the province, we were sitting somewhere closer to 11.5%, 12%. So that's a huge difference. And if I can increase that from you know, 12 to 15 or 16% in future, that is a huge difference. Considering that we only won the municipality with 42 votes. So when you're sitting at home and you say, my vote doesn't count, it's the slimmest ma margin that a municipality has been run by an outright majority in South Africa, 42 votes. And that was largely due to elderly citizens who stood in a queue in Amber Valley, and, and it, was, it was cold that night, and they went out and they voted. A little secret is that it's the best 2,400 rand that I've ever spent. One of my friends has got a coffee, uh, these mobile coffee stations, and I roped him in, I said, bring the coffee. And they went up and down the lines giving people coffee. Um, and we got the highest voter turnout at that particular voting station for the DA in history. Um, 80 something, 85 or 86 percent. And considering a lot of those people are retired. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so do you they feel came out and voted. Do you feel indebted to them in any way? Do you go and see them uh, at the old age homes, maybe sing and dance? <laughs> I was saying to the guys marking me up earlier, there's nothing worse than a white guy on stage dancing for political gain. Um, <laughs> so I won't do that. Um, and I say that in all jest, John. Um, the y yes, in a way. I mean, I, I'm, I'm indebted to, to everyone from the, you know, the Gorko who stood in a line in a very hostile ANC-dominated voting station who decided that she was going to vote differently. Um, and was one of many thousands of people who did that for the first time. To the, the, you know, the young people who, who came out for the first time to vote, to the 350 plus volunteers that we had in our campaign cent call center um, on election day, all of whom were volunteers. People like you and me who said, you know, somebody must do something about it, and they stood up and did it. So I'm, I'm grateful to everyone. Um, I'm indebted to, to everyone. But also, I think, to those who, who didn't vote for me, because I have something to prove. There's a reason why you didn't vote for me. Um, whether you think I'm going to take your RDP house or bring back apartheid or whatever the issue might be, but I need to prove something to you. I need to prove that the 27 years of lies and propaganda about particularly how we, we base our vote largely on race um, is a myth that we're here to work for you regardless of your political background, who you are, where you're from, but we have a job and that's to make government work. So I'm indebted to everyone. Chris, uh, thank you for that and phenomenal work that you're doing on the ground there. Uh, Dylan McKenzie here from the slightly better school that uh, if you roll down the hill, go to Maritzburg College. <laughs> but uh, Rob Hershoff's asked me to 
ask a question on his behalf as I think he's ducked out to take a call. But what exactly have the ANC done to make your life difficult in your new role? And what can you do to highlight and prevent this? Thank you. So they're not a very good opposition, but I, I assume they'll get better over time. Um, I jokingly told them in council the one day that if they want lessons in being in opposition, I'm happy to help them. Um, but they're still in a, a, a government mindset. That's in council. But on the, on the ground is, is to try and destabilize um, the government. So by using you know, policy issues that they themselves voted into government, for example, trying to decrease electricity theft, and use it as a political, political tool to destabilize us, um, to plant seeds with the traditional leadership that you know, the, the DA white government doesn't want to work with you, and you've actually done more for them than, than the ANC government has in the last nine months. Um, so it's those sort of underground tactics that they use. What, what, and this frustrates some of my caucus members as well, but what the, the, the goal is, is to do what we promised we said we would do, is to make sure that if your community was dirty, it becomes clean. Um, if you had you know, problems with your local, I don't know, hall, fix the hall. Because it's through doing what we promised that we, we beat the ANC at what they think is a strategy that is gonna work for them. So they haven't changed their strategy. Um, they lost the elections because they had a poor strategy and poor decision making. Those decisions and that, and those, and that um, strategy is continuing. They haven't learned from their, their mistakes. So if we do what we said we'd do and we do it well, and they continue to do what they think is going to get them back into power, then inevitably we will do better than them. And that's the ANC mentality. They don't change. It's the same organization. It's the same tactics. It's the same strategy. They just give it a new campaign or a new summit or a new operation, whatever, and they continue doing the same thing. Is that nationally? That's everywhere. Um, it's the same, it's the same, same thing everywhere. Uh, so you extrapolate that to 2024. The strategy didn't work, hasn't been working. It's on the slide. Would then the rational mind say it's going to get worse for them in 2024? My personal belief is yes. Um, I think South Africans, it's, almo it's almost like a domino effect. The, the more municipalities, the more provinces, the more areas fall away from the ANC and, the, and people, the rumors are dispelled about this mistrust with, with democracy, um, the quicker change happens. And that's why you've seen the rapid decline in the ANC. I believe there's sort of a cyclical process. There's a um, sort of a, a curve, sorry. ANC voters vote ANC, then they get disillusioned, then they change their vote. And we're sort of in that period now where there's a large disillusionment amongst ANC voters. And political parties are now competing for those voters. But I think more than that is that there is a large chunk of, of voters, citizens, that we don't speak to as political parties. Uh, we all compete for the same voters, and those are the ANC voters. But there's a huge amount of South Africans, largely unemployed, largely disenfranchised, largely who don't have access to, to networks and opportunities and um, you know, the sort of political gains or, or the, yeah, the access that comes with political gains that many of us have. And no one's speaking to them. No one's speaking to that the largest group of people in a meaningful way. Um, so I think that's where the opportunities lie in South African politics, and it's not just with competing for, for ANC votes. Um, I think I answered that in a very political way. I didn't answer your question. Um, but yes, it will, it will get, um, I think the ANC will continue to decline. Um, obviously in pockets it might do better than others, but it will continue to decline on the national front. Um, and the emergence of a new political system will come into South Africa as our democracy matures. <coughs> Graham, one question. No uh, comment. I want Promise. a question, thank you, to Chris about the DA's Youth Development Training Program. I understand that you, Siviwe uh, Kwarube, and uh, Nicholas Nyati, Sivewa Garuba is the parliamentary chief whip, and Nicholas Nyati is the leader of the national leader of the DA Youth. Could you tell us a little bit about that program and if you were on it and how it benefited you? Th thanks, Graham. Can I just see by show of hands how many people here are from Mgeni? Just uh, huh? 
Okay, I need to, need to take down rates numbers here so I can <laughs> check that you've all paid. <laughs> no, Graham, thank you very much for the, um, for the question. Yeah, the, the DA Young Leaders Program is an annual program that's it's about 20 people that are chosen from thousands of applications uh, from around the country. It is essentially a political development program, but is not made up or does not comprise of just politicians. There are human rights activists, lawyers, social activists, um, young politicians, young staff members from across the board um, who participate in a year-long program, uh, which is completely funded by, by D the DA donors. And they fly you to, to Cape Town, to uh, Mont Fleur, four or five times a year, you have a, a mentor, you have a development coach, you go through a number of programs, and it's, it's not a program that aims to produce little you know, DA robots at the end of the day. It's a program that aims to challenge your way of thinking as a young person within the context of the political discourse, um, to empower you with certain skills to better analyze yourself as a leader, but also um, what is happening around you. So it's a very valuable program. I think the application's closed today. Very, very valuable program. Um, and it differs from other political programs where they aim to produce you know, little yellow robots. And despite what um, you know, your leader says, you agree, and if it's wrong, you still agree, and there's no place for, for debate or disagreement, which is completely different um, within the DA's Young Leaders Program. I remember having the daunting I don't know, task opportunity to have to, to disagree with, with Helen. I mean, this is like eight or nine years ago when I was first starting out and I had to disagree with Helen on something uh, that she was very passionate about. And the space was open to do that. Uh, and it's that sort of forum to say, come, let's debate. Let's, let's make ourselves better. Let's sharpen our tools. Uh, iron sharpens iron. And that's what the whole program is about. Great question. Thank you, Graham. Uh, I think we have time for two more. Thank you, me again, Adrian Gardner. I just think that what resonated with me, uh, Chris, and thank you, was you make, you've made a difference. Could I ask you one quick question? Could you make a difference by making your municipality in the area around you the cleanest part of South Africa? Because again, I refer to Rwanda. You go there, there's not one piece of litter there. The country stops for two hours every month, including the president. And I listen to you about your three plastic bags. Please try and get rid of it. Set us an example, because with your TLB, with you trying to do, please clean it up and set that example that we can all follow. The, the hardest part of being in, in, in government is changing human behavior. You can fix the finances, you can fire the rubbish staff, you can cut the corruption, but changing human behavior is very difficult. But challenge accepted. Um, it is something that we, we do aim to do, to be the cleanest town, um, at least in KZN, but hopefully in South Africa. Um, so challenge accepted. Uh, good morning, my name is Tulane Matondo. So my question is that uh, as you are, are fixing uh, Umgeni municipality, uh, are you also giving the youth an opportunity to feel that they own everything that you guys are fixing so that even if you are not there, they could continue to maintain what you guys have worked on. Thank you. Thanks, Tulani. Thank, thanks, Tulani. I think that that question can be broadened to say what happens when, when I'm not there? What happens if the DA is not there? Not just for the youth, but for, for everyone. Um, part part of, of our reconstruction program is to establish a public service or, or civil service that is clearly separated from politics. At the moment, there's a fear uh, from municipal staff that their jobs are aligned to the success of a political party. Whereas, in fact, their jobs are aligned to their performance and the performance of the municipality. So that's a, it's an institutional culture that, that we have to change. And that's done through policies and disciplines and performance management and all the other things that, that many of you do in your companies. But I think for young people in particular, is that we've uh, adopted what we call a sectoral-based approach to, uh, to planning and development. So usually, um, it's usually used as, as you know, political parties will fill a stadium or fill a community hall and call it public participation. And the lady who wants to talk about her broken street light versus the serious investor who wants to come create 200 jobs all put into one room, and there's sort of a boxing match about competing ideas. So we have a program called the Kulumanati program, in, in English, talk to us program 
where we bring different sectors um, and we, we spend hours with each sector um, getting information. I usually start the meeting saying, this is not a forum where you complain. There's, there's, there's other places for that. This is a forum where you give me your ideas, your vision for the municipality. And that has helped us a lot in redesigning how we spend our money on meaningful interventions as opposed to the, the things that you see every day, politicians giving over, handing over, opening this or whatever it might be. So actually, a lot of what we do you don't see. Um, a lot of what we do is supporting those people who are passionate and excellent at what they do. I'm not passionate and excellent about HIV AIDS, for example. My government needs to be passionate and excellent about supporting those people who are passionate about that. Uh, and there's various other examples. So you, you need to, as a government, I believe, support those people who are good and excellent at solving the country's problems as opposed to trying to in-house and in-source and be the center of all the solutions of South Africa. Uh, I'd rather give you money to do what you're good at um, meaningfully than me trying to do it half-assed and bugger it up. Thank you, Chris.